you're right. Your anger is righteous. You have every right to be angry. Your father has not shown up. You know, he has not done what he's supposed to do. You know, you really suffered in all of this. But can we offer something? These kind of relationships that get disturbed when we don't take the time to know what it is to say, to know how to get close to the mic again. Or to get some Sing it doesn't make it happen. I mean, <laughs> that was so horrible. We were offbeat. Welcome. Episode 50, I have in my presence, oh, I'm sorry, I am in the presence of Rissy Cat, also known as Cat. How you doing, sis? I'm good. Thank you so much for joining. I'm excited. I've been watching from afar. Like, this is exciting to be in the space doing this, so thank you for having me. It means so much for me to have you here. Um, I talked to you or reached out, you know, via DM or something about a year ago or so. And I was like, I need, I knew that you were someone that I needed to have on. I just felt like we had to get price processes together right, first right, and right. get a little rhythm right, on right. how to. And how it's going to go. <laughs> yeah, because I was like, you know, you're the kind of woman that I don't feel like should be played with and won't allow herself to I be played with. I appreciate that. Because that so is true. I don't want to waste time. Thought about. Trying to waste your time here and there in a couple, you know, that's a different conversation. Oh my God, but, you made me choke, man. Um, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Disturbing people's peace. Understood. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. uh, um, a little bit about the process okay. for this here, right? Mm -hmm. When I invite you on, I have really no idea on where things are going to go. Right. So the minute you agreed and you give a date, I literally start going out and gathering as much information as I can. I'm right. listening to podcasts, I'm watching videos, CIA interviews, CIA shit. <laughs> Just to kind of get a feel. I mean, I know who you are, but I don't know who you are. Right. Um, and there's a distinct difference, I mm -hmm. feel. And yeah. through the process of you know, trying to understand you a bit more. I came across this term that I wanted to talk about. Okay. Because I don't really, I want to dig deeper into it because it was something that resonated in me and I want to, you know, kind of get an idea mm -hmm. from you on what that means. Cultural architect. Yes. Talk to me about what that means. It's, okay. Essentially, it means that my art practice is whatever I need to use, whatever I need to build to get the vision out, that's what I do. So I care wholly and like for the rest of my life about black people, the black culture globally. Everything that I do centers blackness. Um, but how I communicate blackness might be through a video or recently directing an opera or okay. putting together a panel discussion or, you know, having people go to a lake house for a week and like breathe, you know? So it's, it's a way, f it, it took a while for me to get to that place. And it, cause I needed to create language because people kept wanting to me to be these things. And I was like, yeah, I'm not an event planner. And no, I'm not just a producer. So for me, culture is a living, breathing thing. It's really what I'm steeped in. That's my lens is very, that's when I'm thinking about something, that's the lens I'm looking through. Uh, so I was sitting on a ferry going from London to Amsterdam. Okay. Sometimes I just want to take a slow route. And that's where it came from. I sat and I was like, well, how am I going to define myself moving forward? And culture architect was whispered in my ear and that is what I am. So you were doing it before you had the word to yes. describe it. Yes. And that's what pretty much the foundation of Lil So So Productions is. Lil So So was actually founded in a space of like, weirdly enough, artist management, and it turned into events because I had to create gigs for my clients. Okay. Um, but I've always been a cultural architect. Like when I look back, even in college, some of the stuff that I was doing, it never occurred to me that you could live your life as a black person in a creative space where you weren't the performer. Mm. Um, or you weren't the manager. Uh, so I'm basically blueprinting something that I think hopefully other people can follow. 
Rissy Cat, what is the origin of the name? Who is getting in my business today? Um, okay, so I'm Nigerian, specifically Yoruba, and Yoruba, well, most Nigerians name their children based on their religion and whatever their ethnic group is. Um, so there's usually a combination. My name is quite common in Nigeria. Actually, I have cousins and aunts, and if you went to Prince George's County's graduation, there were a lot of Rissy Cats in the, in the thing. Oh, so okay. whenever you see a combination of uh, Rissy Cat, Yetide, Yabo, um, Rissy Cat signifies the Muslim background okay. that I'm born into. And then my middle name, Yabo, is uh, a name that is given to daughters that are born when a matriarch dies. So usually it's the firstborn daughter that gets that title. And all of those different variations basically say mother is here, mother's return. And you are the eldest. I am the eldest. Out of how many? Out of six. All girls? Nope. I'm the eldest. Um, five from my mom. And then my dad has my, my other sister. Uh, so there are there were three girls. Sophie, who was the youngest of us all, died, which is why Lil So So is named Lil So So. And then uh, boys, three boys, three boys, three girls. Were you born here in the yeah, U.S.? Born okay. In DC, actually. Okay, so you're from this area, mm -hmm. like yeah, your okay. stomping grounds. Well, I was born in D.C., but my dad uh, is a retired airline mechanic, so he was kind of this big deal African kid who got recruited, and so at six we moved to Miami. So I spent my formative years in Miami. Oh, really? Yeah. I would never have guessed that. Listen, hated every minute of it. R what, what was bad? I mean, other than it being Florida. I, well, it's Florida. Uh, <laughs> it always felt too slow. Okay. Um, I grew up, I mean, I'm, you know, 70s kid, but I grew up in the 80s, and uh, the treatment of Haitians at the time that I was coming up was, was particularly disgusting. Uh, there was definitely a correlation between how Cubans were treated and whiteness and how Haitians were treated and blackness. And, mm. um, you know, I had to deal with a lot of stuff. I was living in, our family lived in South Miami as opposed to North Miami where a lot more Nigerians were. So I was always the only African kid with the weird name and, yeah. you know, being asked to really, was bullied terribly through, actually up through high school, was like heavily bullied uh, for a variety of things. And I had immigrant parents who didn't understand the politics of culture and texture around black American, like skin color and like hair. It was a mess, it was a mess. So. I didn't like it, but I got through it. How did you, how did you get through it? You know, it's funny. I was thinking about this the other day because I had a feeling this was going to come up. Um, I don't know outside to say that my ancestors are really good. They like, there's a lot of protection around me. I also knew as a, as a young person, younger person that this wasn't the, the end. Like mm. people were like, high school was the best years of your life. I was like, that's some bullshit. That can't possibly be true. <laughs> okay. Uh, no. And so I, I, I just, like when I think back to high school and I particularly because elementary and middle school was brutal, but high school, you know, it's, you're coming into your own, your body's changing, your perspective is changing. Um, I was really bold and, uh, mm. in a way, in a way that didn't make sense for somebody who was being bullied. So I was like, I'm gonna play tennis and. I'm gonna join the dance team. Yeah, you know, I, people bullied me for all sorts of things, but I was good at what I did. So I just knew that if I could just get through it, I would be fine. And I also, you know, <laughs> it didn't occur to me. I have like a very, um, you know, I joke around about how I was a queen in my former life. So sometimes I was just like, these people are peasants. So I just need to get through it. <laughs> okay. You know? I'm serious. Like, I was like, I had to really, I'm, I'm very observant. So, a lot of the things that I was being teased for didn't make any sense. Like, I had black kids teasing me for being African who were the same, com I'd be teased for being dark skinned. I'm like, but we're the same complexion. Like, I don't understand what's going on. Um, I was a weird dresser, so, you know. Give me an example of what oh, that Oh shit, looked. I would throw shit together. You know, it'd be a floral pattern skirt and some stripes on the top. Like, I don't know, I just want, you know, my okay. dad would be like, why are you dressing like an artist? What is going on? Because I just, my, the way that I, wanted to express myself it was just it was just big and so I was living in a situation where I was constantly culturally and like socially being told I had to be small and I was like this is uncomfortable 
So I would find ways to, to let it out. But it was, it was stressful. It was really stressful. I just knew, though, that this, I just have to get through it. It'll be done soon. Did you nurture, like, more of your creative side when, or did you, well, I guess, go in when you were going through that? You know what? It's one of the things that I think is interesting about black people and creativity is that sometimes you don't think that you don't realize you're being creative mm -hmm. until you look back. So my creativity didn't show up as obvious. You know, I was on the dance team. I played tennis. But one of the things that I would do is I would move my room around. Like, I would get up, and every couple of months, I would pull, push everything into the, the hallway, and I would rearrange my room. I don't know why I did it, but it would make me feel better. And so I remember my parents. So when you're, you know, when you're first gen, sometimes you, I understand the language. I don't speak it as well. So they would be whispering in your butt at the end of the hall. My dad was like, why does she do this? Mm. My mother was like, just let her. Like, I don't know, but like, let her do it. And so it never occurred to me to ask if I could paint my room. So I had this yellow room and I would just move things around. I would rearrange things. I would, you know, fold clothes and put them in different places. So there was, there was a creativity around space that I was probably exhibiting, but I didn't know that that's what it was. I was also really good at writing, hmm. only in the sense of like schoolwork. So I was the kid that everybody came to for introductions and conclusions. Okay. Oh. <laughs> but see, I can't figure out this, this last part. So I would read the paper like, all right, try this. Mm -hmm. So there was always like, Anyone who's ever sat with me, um, just hanging out, who's a creative, who's, you know, we're not, we're not there to problem solve, but we end up start talking about things. Yeah, yeah. My brain moves really fast in terms of, oh, I know how to string something together. So there's always, I've always probably been creative, but it wasn't recognized as yeah. that. Um, and oftentimes it was folded into work. So mm. whether I was working at the, I used to work at the theater and the way that I would arrange popcorn boxes or, you know, later on in school when I was like, hey, I want to throw a, a black film festival because I'm a projectionist. I was, <laughs> you know, I used to show the movies at the Hawk Theater at University of Maryland when I transferred and I was like, you know what? I could get some films. I could throw together, you know, I want to see black films. Hmm. So I'm going to put together this thing. And it, no one ever said, you know, you could probably turn this into something. It was just a matter of what I did. It's funny you mentioned the... Um the room thing, I never would have connected that dot. I had, when I had to move my room around and there was something about altering the environment to yeah. match a feeling. Yeah. And, 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 and once I was able to get those two things to align, mm -hmm. it was like a, oh. Ah. I could go on with my life. And then you just, yeah. you just and, and it's funny how that's carried over yeah. into, my adult life yeah. now. You should and, see my house, it's insane right now. And I can't, I never would have thought create. Yeah. Creativity, rather. And the same with the, people used to always tell me, man, you should talk. And I'm like, you got a gift. And when it, and I didn't understand what that meant. Right. Because it was just something I just did. Sometimes yeah. I'm talking shit. Sometimes right. I'm, you know, whatever it is, I'm right. just talking. But to your point, not realizing that it's actually a form of creativity. Yeah. Um, and... how you can demonstrate that in a lot of different ways, which back to the little so-so piece. Talk about what that is and what you do through that name. So it's a playground. That's how I see it now. Before it was a mechanism to honor my sister. Um, it was a way to create a business because I was I had clients that I fell into the to a lot of this. I knew that I knew that I liked creating events. I didn't have the language to understand that they're actually experiences, but I knew that at the time that events was something that I enjoyed doing. Um, and I was always thinking of ways for people just to have a really good time, but I was also always thinking of ways for people to have connection. So, mm. like one of the things that I absolutely loved, like in its heyday when it, LSP was doing events. We would have a lot of women 
that would come, a lot of black women who would come by themselves. And anyone who understands how black women travel, like that's a big deal for black women who like, I feel comfortable and safe enough that I'm just gonna go by myself. Yeah. Um, we tend to travel like in packs, you know? Mm. And so um, it would be like more than half of the room would be women. And a lot of them would just come knowing that when they got there, they were gonna see people, like there was no worry, they felt safe. And so I liked cultivating that. And I also love, like, there are people that I know that are married, that are besties, you know, that had formed you know, relationships in terms of friendships and businesses because they met at an LSD True event. That. And mm. that's kind of something that, because that's what culture is. If, you, if, it's, if it's allowed to kind of do what it's supposed to do, it forces people to see how they're connected. And so, that is a very behind the scenes role that you chose to it take on. It chose me. I don't think I chose it. It chose you. It chose me. Or, yeah. or, or you chose to respond to. I chose to respond to it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you don't get a lot of attention because of that. It's weird. Um, I can't say that. Um, Initially, I had to be really like super aggressive. Like y'all will get, you know, well, because initially what's fueling this is the fact that I have clients who can't get gigs because there are these pathways that I have not taken. Like as a manager, I haven't gone and kissed these rings and all this other bullshit. So I was like, well, fuck it. I'll just create my own shit. Okay. Because I'm Nigerian and that's what we do. We create our own shit. So, um... Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, because of the way that I kind of operated, it just kind of became a thing. And then once I was able to get in front of the right people, because, I mean, like that 90s, that late 90s, you know, two, early 2000s space of U Street is rife with just, this is like the golden era of U Street before mm -hmm. it becomes this, this monstrosity that it is now. There were all kinds of things happening. And there were, there were two other sisters in the poetry scene who were doing some really dope stuff. Um, and then there was this one sister, so, you know, Ritsiana, I have to shout her out. She was the only other woman, only other black woman that I saw in a cultural space. So not being a club promoter, but actually bringing people together. Um, super fire personality, you know. She was just, she wasn't like an active mentor, but I watched her and she was very open. And was like, hey, yeah, come through, you know, you want a client to perform. So, you know, there were certain ways that I had to create my own space. It didn't occur to me at the time that I was, I didn't think that I was going to be doing this for the rest of my life. Mm. I just, I didn't know what, I, was, I wasn't thinking about the future. I was just kind of like, yo, I like doing this. This is fun. You know, I leave my day job. I go do this. This, this, this feels like the life and cool beans. And then it just started to pick up its own space of energy and I was like oh this is a thing um, but when I sit down and I look back I've always been this way so when I think of an architect like I don't know who made this place right I just know that I live in it right as you're creating these cultural creating and curating these cultural spaces that connect and and people get to feel and and, and live in experience right I feel like it's easy for the architect to, to get, get lost. lost in because it's not you're you're creating something that people live. Yeah. Not like they don't they walk away with a feeling, but and that feeling could you could have contributed to mm -hmm. them feeling that way. But I, I feel like for someone who's doing that, that they're and doing it repeatedly. Right. If there isn't a direct acknowledgement of your contribution mm -hmm. in that way mm -hmm. that it's real easy for you to just get lost in the get lost and then go do it again and yeah. get lost and then go do it again and just giving and giving and giving and creating and creating right. and creating and then one day you it's like damn I've been so that's a really that's a, an excellent insight and what I'll say is that I'm I think I'm blessed and, and lucky and I don't really like that word lucky but blessed in the sense that my motivation for doing it wasn't it wasn't about me 
because I could easily be bitter if, if, if it was. I wasn't creating these things hoping that somebody would somehow to see me and like whatever. LSP as a company was the thing that I pushed out there. Um, but I was the face going to make the deals. I was the one having to um, get the contracts together. So there was always a sense. I was the one collecting the money. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, I, I had to roll up on people like, yo, where's my client's money? Like that, you know. So the notoriety piece or, you know, not being seen as the thing. What is fascinating is that that is an issue that happens on the front part of it, on the, on the other side. So there were people who loved being able to say, hey, I know Kat. Mm -hmm. like, and when they would introduce me, like, yo, she runs DC. I'm like, mm, maybe not all of DC, maybe a little bit. Um, so there was, I had already decided a couple things that I was going to use Kat as opposed to my full name because I wanted to protect my full name. But Kat was something that was easy to remember. I do all this all the time you know, standing out here, being sort of different in that way. So standing out was always something that I've done, whether I liked it or not. What I find that issue of you don't know who does whatever is that often that is coming straight up. Honestly, a lot of men would try to sort of ignore what I was doing, mm. um, like try to go around me to get to the good stuff, as it were. And so it took a lot of me kind of making sure that the people that I was with knew how to big me up because that's a big piece of it. Like the reason sometimes the people in the background get lost is because the people who know that they do this work don't big them up. There's a responsibility, I think, if I'm an artist that's performing and I am doing really well and I don't shout out the manager and I don't shout out the agent and I don't shout out the makeup artist, then that's how we get lost and put in the background, right? And that's how people become bitter. But part of what I was doing, part of what I've always done is coming from a place of, this is bigger than me. Black culture, diasporically, is so rich. Yeah. There's no reason to, you know, we don't have to go outside for other things. But there was also a really clear understanding that the way black culture is presented is very limited, it's very biopic. So, you know, I used to call myself like the anti-ratchet superhero because what was pre being presented as black culture was this very sort of loosey-goosey ratchet, you know, when we party, we only want to pop bottles and we only want to jump on Twerk the and shit. I'm like, that's not what, that's a part of it, but there are other aspects. Yeah. So part of what I was presenting was like, hey, you can come and, I'm, so anybody who is a child of immigrants, particularly Africans, know you don't stop partying because you get married, because you have kids, because you get older. It just changes. Yeah. I remember going to parties with my parents as a kid. Mm. I remember my mom, like my aunt right now, I don't even know how old Auntie Rissy is. She go to a party every weekend. So there is a sense of sort of celebration culture that's a big part of what I've grown up with. So me, I was like, well, the club doesn't have to be the only place you can get your life. You can, there's other ways that we can do things. So whether it's out in the park or whether it's in a bowling alley, like this idea is possible, but I also have people who big me up, you know? And I think that helps the background piece because it, it does happen, you know, particularly, you know, a good example is Axel F. I'm a part of this crew three DJs, Eddie does the videos, I'm like the, the marketing and I'm sort of like part of the creative brain trust. What usually happens is people try to move me out of the way because I'm not a DJ. And they don't understand the role that I play is vital to how, I mean, Jamil will tell you, like I'm vital to that, to that understanding. So what it takes is my boys being like, Oh, we're not taking a picture without Kat. Yeah. So that's really, I've had the benefit. Now, it hasn't always worked out well. Like, there have been issues. But over time, I think me sort of doing my own thing with the interviews and all that other stuff, but also being very present. Like, what I notice, like, when I go to friends, like, when I go to other people's productions and I go and see my friends do their things, they're so busy working, they look like they're part of the staff. You wouldn't know that they're producing it. So there, I've had moments where I've had to say, hey, I need the next time you do an event to have the kind of help that lets you go around so people can know that you're the one that did this. Yeah. And that's something I had to learn early on mm. like, where people were like, yo, 
people need to know that you did this. Don't be out here working so hard. Let, let's figure out volunteers. I had somebody suggested that, like, we need to get volunteers. You should not be working the event. You should be out here. And so that kind of advice kind of, I think it's helped to kind of, you know, keep me from sort of fading in the background. Um, my sort of the next trajectory is really about being more present in the foreground. Uh, but I'm not going to lie that there is, there's, I like sometimes not being in the foreground, you know, because it's, there's a lot, there's a different kind of pressure in that way. And I think there's, there's an opposing cost mm -hmm. to it as well. So you do a lot for a lot of people, yeah. right? That's just what you do. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly enough, your middle name means mother, I think you Listen. said? Listen. So, and what's crazy is, like, there's this strong, nurturing, and I don't even know if it's a, it's a, um, I feel like you are the kind of person mm -hmm. that doesn't get checked on. You're right. I mean, to a certain extent, I have, at a, I have a really amazing community. So okay. I have people in my life who, over time, have become, because this is the beauty of when you kind of walk in your purpose, um, like when you truly walk in your purpose, what happens is you get sent people who can help you continue your purpose. So I have people who don't judge my lack of calling, who are very forgiving awesome. when I don't, you know, remember birthdays, who... Um, We'll be like, hey, haven't heard from you. Just checking in. I have some amazing brothers in my life who are like, yo, you need to come over. I'm making you dinner. Nice. You know, I don't know what's going on over there, but I don't like the last time I saw you, you didn't look like you were taking care of yourself. So come over. Um, so I have people in my life that um, that check on me, but I had to like I had to cultivate that that space. Like I. I definitely am, I'm the, you know, I'm the friend that I'm dropping everything. Something goes down, I'm on a plane, I'm in the car, whatever I need to do to get to you, I'm going to do what I got to do. I'm not necessarily, because of the way that I live my life, um, it's harder for me to be like, hey, let me check, let me run down my list of people and check on them. Mm -hmm. um, but everyone knows that you call me, I'm going to stop what I'm doing, I'm going to listen, I'm going to do what I need to do to make sure you're safe. And it doesn't matter what it is. If I don't know it, I'm going to find somebody who, who does. Um, but the imbalance that used to happen doesn't happen anymore. Because it used to be imbalanced. Um, but now I feel like, yeah, I have a, an amazing crew of people. And I've had, you know, some health scares in the past three years where people, like, rallied and, like, blanketed and covered and made sure that I was okay. So in that respect, I'm thankful. Like, I'm, I'm really blessed with some good folks around me. How are you with asking for help? Oh, I suck at that. Okay. I actually have a coach <clears throat> that I work with because uh, we're trying to move me into a space where I'm doing more of this and I'm actually sharing my story. Um, not through a creative way, but actually through like a speaking, you know, sort of this is what it is type of thing. And my homework, every time we have a session, I'm going to need you to go ask somebody for something. I'm like, but why? She's like, because you have to, you got to use that muscle. So, yeah, it's, I suck at it. When's the last time you asked for help? We're, in, we're, we're technically in June. <laughs> um, well, during the opera run, so I was in Pittsburgh for two weeks, and there was a very trying day, and I had to like, I had to articulate that I didn't feel protected, which took a lot out of me, and I also had to articulate that I needed help, but I did it. Gold star for Rissy. Gold star. Eh. Who say silver? <laughs> it's just <laughs> you, somebody got to give. You can't give yourself I a can't gold, give star. gold star. <laughs> somebody got to give. Somebody got to give. <laughs> well, I thought it was a gold star. Like, oh, look at you asking for help and saying that you feel vulnerable. Look at that being all human. Woo. That's a. I struggle with uh, that too, and I've gotten a little bit better. A bit, or like we talking a smidge, or like a chunk. What are we talking about? A smidge. It's real because it, it's real hard for me to 
Can't even say it. Yeah. <laughs> you caught that. You was like, oh my God. To, <laughs> to say, I need you. Like, yeah. that's. I know. That's a. Uh, just even saying that, like. I felt it. Period. I like, God. I've had moments. So. Damn. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard. And I mean, you know, when you. Because you've said that before about me being a nurturer and um, be careful what you name your children. Um, I, <laughs> I don't know that I'm actually a nurturer in sort of the, the natural sense as much as I've been conditioned to be one. Mm-mm. And so there's a conditioning when you are an eldest daughter, particularly um, in an African situation, like the amount of responsibility that you have at a young age really kind of shapes how you're going to sort of show up in the world. And um, compassion is not something that my culture has a lot of. And so the beauty of sort of being raised in the West is that you have these examples of different parenting styles that don't match what you're used to. So you get to look and see, you know, you're like, oh, shit, like, you know, they can actually ask questions, you know, and. They can, you know, they can push back a little, like, oh, they don't get slapped for asking questions or, you know, they actually can say how I feel. And so you start to, like, you know, at some point you start to, because we can always say, oh, that's just white people, but there's something to be said about the way um, some of us have grown up that the trauma is like, and the PTSD is real. And so I know that a large part of how I am is because I didn't necessarily feel like I got it as a kid. So... I try to, I don't want people feeling like they, you know, compassion is something that I leave with. Your mom passed away. Yes. When you were 19. Yes. Did that kind of, like the conditioning piece of it, having, being the eldest and your mom transitioning at that age for you, did that, did that kind of like strengthen, strengthen the conditioning to be like. First of all. Shout out to my mama. Um, she was very progressive for a Nigerian woman. So I had a lot of responsibility as a kid. Like, And even she acknowledged that it wasn't right the way you had to step up. But she was by herself, her and my dad. My dad, because of his work situation, like when we lived here in, in D.C., she would, um, he would have to, because they weren't sure about how they were going to do this thing before we moved completely to Miami, It was a transition piece. So he would go, work, come home. So he wasn't always here. And so I had to, like I was carrying a key at five. I was a latchkey kid at five. And my mother was really, she was a no-nonsense woman. She was very sweet, but she was a no-nonsense woman. So like, you couldn't lay in bed. You had to get up. And you know, my brother's about three years after me, and then the next brother is about, four and a half, five years. And so, no, maybe even six. So I was having, you know, you learn how to watch your brothers and sisters. Like, that's part of what you do. But there was an issue where she didn't, I don't know why I didn't have, like, like daycare was, after we got, after you, you get to kindergarten, it's like, okay, someone has to pick you up and all this other stuff. Um, I now understand geography-wise, my brother used to work at NASA, where we lived, it was basically in Hyattsville, where I live now. So that distance was significant. And so I don't remember how I would get home, but I had a key and I had to carry this key. And my mother was like really clear how important this was. We had codes for when I got in, all of these things, I had to watch my brothers. And, but there was always this sense of if you mess up, there's gonna be trouble. Um, there's always this sense too, like if your brothers mess up, you're gonna be in trouble. So she knew um, when I was going applying to college, she was like, "Go as far away from this family as possible. I want you to go and live your life. I don't don't look back." She wanted me to go to Howard because mm. I was we were living in Florida. She wanted me to go to D.C. Um, I chose University of Florida because Howard was a mess. The organization was real sketchy, and I was like, "I don't know if I want to go here." But I went to University of Florida. She was like, "Live your life, do your things." You know, we would talk and we would check in. But after she died, shit, it was. It was a disaster. I had to, I had to transfer back. My dad, um, culturally speaking, men are just 
they're coddled, you know. Uh, that was something I learned much later, like yeah. about like African. They are coddled men, in I ways didn't. like, oh, well, because you're bringing home a check or whatever, then that's all you, you've done, you've provided. And so I was basically had to step in and raise my siblings. And Sophie had chronic, she had sickle cell, but then she developed some other things. So at 19, I became a matriarch. I've been a matriarch of the family since then. And it was, the, it was bad, like really bad in terms of the amount of responsibility that I had. So at 19, when you're in college and you're just mucking about and you, you know getting into trouble and doing stupid shit, I'm literally like running, making hospital runs because my sister's having these pain crises and I'm sitting in the emergency room and like I had to make decisions. So one of the things that I did was I moved out, which was a huge, 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 huge thing. Like I had to like gird myself and like, you have to do this because I developed an ulcer. Um, I wasn't well and I was like, I can't die because my mother died, like I have to do something. And I had to really channel that part of her that was like, go live your life. So while I wasn't living my life fully, I was, once I moved out of my dad's house, it was a bit easier, but the conditioning was real. Like I was essentially Sophie's mom. So if how she old had, was she? She was six when I was 19. So that it was like, you know, a huge, well, it was a 13 year age difference. Um, but for a long time, I, I looked older than I actually was. So people just assumed that she was my daughter. So we would go into the emergency room and I'd have to be like, this is my sister, not my daughter. Um, you know, when you take on these roles, you end up you end up operating as an adult, even though you're not a full grown person. Yeah. And so I was making decisions about her life because my dad, you know, even though he was here, he just he just couldn't manage it. Like it was it you know, it really messed with our relationship. Like it took a long time for me to like move move that, close that chapter and like we're better now, but at the time, all of those elder daughter expectations like solidified. Like it was like, it was like the prison the, the prison gates closing. You could I could hear it. Like this is your life now. I even remember we went to um, when my mom died because my family sent us a little girl forty day thing, and we had to go. Well, I didn't go, but the year later we had to go to Miami because there was this big reception because she died in Nigeria, so there was no funeral, and a lot of our community was based in in Miami, and so. I remember all of my siblings are there, were there, my dad's crying. My brothers have gotten up and just walked out because they can't handle it. And I want so bad to like roll on the floor and like have like a moment. And you know, that flip switched and I had to like- You're the strong one. I just had to zip it up. And so I had to go check on my brothers check on my dad, no tears, you know? Even though on the inside, I feel like I'm about to die. And so that was kind of the way that I had to manage. And that, yeah, uh, Sophie died 10 years later. So once I ushered her on to the other side, I bought a house because I promised her a house. I bought a house by myself. <laughs> Did she live in? Or she, she, she made it for, she was there for a week and a day. And then she died in her bed. Yep, so she died in the house, which is what I wanted, I didn't want her to die in the hospital. So when they told me all the things, like we could do this, we could do that, I was like, I'm gonna take my kid home. So I took her home. I was her legal guardian by that point. So, yeah. You got the house. Got the house. You, you promised Sophie or your mom? I promised Sophie I was gonna get her a house. Okay. So I got her house. So Sophie was big on houses. Well, when we made a decision, well, when I made the decision that I was gonna so I have to take a step back. Because of her medical conditions, she tapped out of my dad's insurance at a million dollars. The cap was a million. Yeah, that's how, like, we, it was crazy. And so my dad tells me this, and I was like, okay. At the time, I had a little trade association job. I was out here doing big things. I went to the HR. I was like, look, my sister's really ill. Um, my dad's insurance is capped out. Short of me adopting her, could I, if I became her legal guardian, could I put her on my insurance? And they were like, we're gonna make it happen. So they talked to the insurance company, um, and they're like, if you can give us legal guardianship status, we can make it happen. So I became her legal guardian, and when I was looking for a place to, at that point I decided she was just gonna live with me full time. Um, yeah, the apartments didn't make any sense for what they were asking for, so I was like, I'm gonna buy a house. So I found a house, and I bought it. And 
Yeah. Ten days? How many? A week and a day. Week and eight days eight later. Eight days. Eight days later. She was, yeah. They told me, so there was a big meeting. They tell us, oh, she has like, you know, there, there's like, I remember this room of just doctors everywhere. And at that point, my dad and I, we were not getting along. So he was on one side. I was on the other side. And they're talking all, I said, how long do we have? Because all this you're telling me, and I'm not interested in because we're not doing surgery. So how long do we have? And they were like four to six months. So I was like, okay, I need you to discharge her. I'm gonna take my kid home and we're gonna go, you know, she was already hospiced up with the port. So that's what we were gonna do. So yeah, I had to, you know, take, it was a huge, it was a huge responsibility, but um, yeah, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Do you reflect at all on and I'm not sure if you're the kind of person that does this on so like how, are, are you like a why me kind of person? No. Okay. I tried it once, it didn't go well, so I stopped. Cause, okay. it, was, cause it was almost like, why not you? You know? Um, and I remember <laughs> I was in the library at University of Maryland and something really good had happened. I don't know what it was, but I went to call my mother and I was like, shit, you know? And she'd been dead for like, by that point, like three years, and I was like, what? And I got really sad, and I was walking around campus just mad. And there was like this sense, this, this voice was like, stop walking. Look at your life right now. And I'm like, what is there to look at? I'm like, no, just look at your life. Look at what you've been able to do. You've transferred over. You found the major that you loved. You are, you know, you've started, I started this group um, with other sisters uh, around traditional African dance. You know, I was projecting, like, I had a group, a good group of folks around me. I'm, they were like, look at your life. Stop, don't worry about the why. Just focus on the living. And at that point, I just stopped worrying about it. Because I'd spent the first, what, two, three years of my death just mad at God. Like, so you take the one that we love and you leave the one we can't stand. And that's what we have to deal with. Like, what kind of nonsense is this? My mother was a praying woman and a spiritual woman. And this is what you leave us with. I was yeah. pissed. And so, yeah, at some point I had that moment and I was like, yeah, the why, no matter what answer you get, it's never going to be good enough. Never good enough. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. And I think, I think the asking that question or even the types of questions you ask in general kind of re reflect back to you where you are in the understanding or the acceptance is yeah. probably even a better, a yeah. better word for it. Because to your point, like why, I remember asking when I was younger, because of like the way I grew up, I was like, why me? Like, why, mm -hmm. why did I, why did I get this motherfucking right, family? Right, right, like, right. I could have got. All the families I could have got. All the motherfucking families in the world. You throw me in with this joint, it just mm -hmm. did not, it, it didn't make sense. But now, gonna be 46 this year, looking back, it's like, okay, I see why. Like all of it just fits so perfectly into the plan mm -hmm. to where it's like, and some would even suggest, depending on the spiritual practice, that you chose that family for a reason. Yeah. You know, that there's lessons in order for your evolution that you needed to have, and that was the only way you were going to have those, those moments. And why do you think we associate... Why do, we, why do you think we most people feel that a choice isn't a choice if it's not conscious? I mean... I, you know, that's a good question. I think there's a lot of conditioning out there. Um, I remember a lot of the people at work didn't know what was happening with my situation. And I remember once there was, it was you know, I worked for a trade association. I was one of the few black people that was like not in the mail room or in the reception. Like I was, you know, working in the international trade part. And I was like this thing that people were fascinated with. So I went to lunch with one of the white senior advisors or whatever, and we were just talking. We were sharing a little bit about our lives, and he was like, "How do you, how do you do all that for your family?" And I, in my mind, I was like, "What kind of question is that?" He was like, "You know, I'm just, I'm so impressed with you for, <laughs> for choosing um, to stay and like help your family." Cause you don't owe your family anything. And I was like, in my head, I was like, oh, that's crazy to me. That doesn't make sense. And it had never occurred to me, like I'd had, this was the second run and I'd had with this idea of choice that I'd never thought about. It never occurred to me 
that I had a choice in whether or not I would abide by the rules and the expectations of being the eldest daughter um, because I had siblings who I was like, let's not throw them to the wolves because we got a shitty situation. So I think the choice piece for a lot of people, you tell yourself what you have to tell yourself to sleep at night. You know what I'm saying? Um, and sometimes we pretend that we don't have a choice or we, we say that we don't have a choice because then our, if we don't move forward, we can say, oh, it wasn't my fault. But everything is a choice, you know? Wh whether we realize it or not, and that was like a hard truth that I had to learn because it had never occurred to me that me operating in the spaces that I was operating in was, was me making that decision. It didn't feel like I'd made the decision. Yeah. It just felt like, oh, you have to do this. But I was like, do I have to do this? You know, like who says I have to do this? So the conditioning around, you know, expectations and familial ties and what you're supposed to do, being a woman, it's just, it all kind of plays into that. But how's your relationship with your dad? Oh, it's so much better. Really? Let me tell you something. It's actually really good, which I know surprises a lot of people, but um, I had to come to some, some truths. So I, I'm a Sagittarius, and truth is a big part of, like, even if I don't share with anybody else, I'm always internally working through the truth of the matter of something. My dad and I's relationship after Sophie died was really bad. And culturally, I was operating outside of what was, was allowable, acceptable, whatever, because I was just like, I'm not, she's dead now, I'm done. I ain't got nothing to say to you, man. The boys are older. Uh, I remember her funeral was traumatic as hell because it was done in a very Muslim style, so it was very quick and like quick. Like she died on a Friday, the next day she was buried. Like it just, mm. it was, it was, it was traumatic. Um, and I remember an aunt. So my friends had put together a repast for me and like had come with me to the burial site. Um, so there was, because it was a very dramatic scene. And this was in Nigeria? No, this was here. Sophie oh, here. died here. Okay. Yeah, so Sophie oh, died. Oh, my bad. Yeah, my, so, okay, I'm thinking about that. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. So I actually never got a chance to, uh, when my mom died, I wasn't there. And I wasn't able to, like, yeah. They didn't tell me she died until I'd gotten to Maryland, and then my dad got on a plane to go take care of everything, so I didn't actually get to have that initial funeral thing. But when Sophie died, it was, um, it happened, like like I said, Muslims bury their, their dead quickly, like immediately the next day. And um, an aunt called me, I was on my way to the repast, and my, an aunt called me, and she was like, ah, You've done so, you, she, she called me Yabo because that's how it was known in, in Miami. And she's like, ah, you've done so well. I'm so proud of you. But your job isn't done. You have to take care of your brothers and your daddy. And I was like, auntie, I'm done. Sophie is dead. I'm not taking care of anybody else. Do not ever call me again about this nonsense. And I hung up the phone. Mm. And I think about three months later, I got another call from another auntie. And she's like, you know, because in our culture, everybody reports you to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. Like, if they can't control you, they'll talk about you they'll to someone. They'll report you. They'll report you, and someone older will come and, like, ah, what, what is going on? Da, 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 da. So an aunt called me, and she was like, ah, your, your daddy says that you haven't called him. You know, what is going on? You weren't raised this way. I was like, oh, I went off. I was like, you want to know what's been going on for the past 10 years? I said, y'all in Miami, you don't know. You just see pictures, you think everything's good. So I just ran it down. I was like, this is what's been going on. This is why I'm not speaking to anyone. And she, and to get a Nigerian to apologize when they're older than you is a feat unto itself. So she was just like, I'm sorry. She's like, I shouldn't have called you. Mm. I didn't know. I was like, I know, I said, I know you didn't know. That's why I'm telling you. Please tell everybody to stop. I don't want anybody calling me. I said, because you people have, when my mom died, no one ever asked me how I was doing. You just told me, stay with your family until you get married because you have to take care of your family. That's the advice you gave me. Sophie's died. You people are still calling me and telling me that I need to take care of my family. No one's asking. Not one of you has asked me how I'm doing. Like, you've never actually asked me, how are you doing? So, you know, that lack of compassion has been something that, you know, just has been missing. And so when I was 
thinking, you know, I had a day, I think, I don't even know, maybe a decade after Sophie's past, our relationship isn't that great, and I'm just fuming. I just woke up one day, and I was just pissed. And I called my brother, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to tell Dad what I think of him, da 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 Because as his oldest, we have butted heads before. And, you know, I'm respectful, but we, we've had moments, which... Mm. So he knows that I'm capable of that if I if I need to. And so I, I'm telling you, the ancestors, they were like, you're right. Your anger is righteous. You have every right to be angry. Your father has not shown up. You know, he has not done what he's supposed to do. You know, you really suffered in all of this. But can we offer something? <laughs> I was like, what do you people want? And there was just this sense of... Now, this is the ancestors saying These are that? my ancestors. These are my, my people, what I call my people. Okay. So I'm, I have these internal conversations with myself. Okay. Because I'm constantly trying to make sure, you know, remember at the top of this, I said I, my lens is cultural. So when I'm thinking about how I'm feeling about my dad, how disappointed I am, it's not just my pain that I'm processing. I'm also processing the fact that analytically speaking, as an analytically mind person, you do what you know. I know how my dad grew up. He didn't have, his mother died when he was really young. He was removed from the home and left to go stay with an uncle, um, with a, yeah, with an uncle. My dad comes from a, from a, 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 poly, a, poly, a polygamous family, so multiple wives, and that is always a disaster for how children are growing up. So I, as I'm pissed off about what my father has not done and just the amount of trauma I think I have and all of these issues that I have I can't you know in terms of dating in terms of money in terms of feeling like you know being taken care of like all of these pressures I'm also having the simultaneous understanding that my father grew up with very basically nothing yeah. it is essentially a self-made man he was able to come to this country and build a life for himself and a family and yeah he's done a shitty job at being a father but he also is a human being and so there was this moment where they were like, you could say all those things that you want to say to your father, tell him how he has failed you, and you'd be well within your rights to do that. But there are consequences to doing that. If you do that because of the way, because my power is actually in, you know, when I say something to somebody, I know the damage it can do if I'm not careful. You could hurt him, in ever, you know, irrevocably. He's the only parent you have left. The other side of this is you could accept that he's been a shitty human being, understand that a lot of that comes from not having had, you know, what tools. the tools, and try to make a different path. So I went to my dad's house and I said, tell me what it was like when you grew up, for gro when you, as you were growing up. And he starts to tell me all the stuff that we'd never talked about. And we had a couple of bumps, you know, because I'm not a practicing Muslim, which, you know, pisses him off when I say that, but I'm not. And he was always trying to make me, like, you need to pray, da-da-da. I was like, listen, you don't, I'm a grown woman. You don't need to worry about that. I got that part. And so me not being a practicing Muslim has always been like a thorn in his side because, you know, I'm like, Dad, you're not going to hellfire because I'm not Muslim. <laughs> that's not going to be the reason. Like, that's, you know, but... I get it. Like that's your religion. I respect it, but that's not that's not where I am. So the bumps along the road. With each bump, I had to clarify. I'm not. I'm not that girl. You know, I had to say to him, I like who I am. You can either like who I am, or you can just live your life without me in it. It's up to you. Acts right. There's another bump, and I'm like, you know, it's you make it really hard to be your daughter, and I'm getting really tired of this. Um, and then you know, over time. I would just stop avoiding him, and I would I would spend time with him. He would have, you know, he he started to change, and you know, I remember one day he called me. He's like, "Hey, beautiful." I was like, "Who are you talking to?" My father never calls me that. He always tells me he loves me, but he never he doesn't talk. He doesn't play with me like that. And so he's like, "Yeah, I'm making dinner. Come come have dinner with your father." And I was like, "I'm sorry, who is this?" So over time of just recognizing his humanity, I think there was a sense of I want to be better, like. Our parents, regardless of what they say or don't say, they know when they failed us. I, I genuinely believe that every parent out here who has estranged children know why those children don't mess Agreed. with them. And I think they even know even when it's 
when you got a relationship, I mean, yeah. estranged doesn't mean you don't speak. It just right. means it's not what you. It's not a night. It's not a close thing. Yeah. But they know why. Yeah, they know. They may never admit it out loud, but they know. And so I knew my dad knew. So we would, when we would bump heads, he would like, I know that you're the reason this family survived, and da 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 da. And you know, I tell everybody, I was like, why is it that under duress? <laughs> When we're arguing, yeah. that's when you tell me you're proud of me. Like, why is it that you never just say that shit, like, other times? And so it was mm. a behavioral change that needed to happen. And I think me wanting, I remember saying, do you want to be one of those people that when your dad dies, that what you're grieving is all the shit you didn't get to do or didn't get to say? You said that? To myself, yeah. yeah. And I was like, no, I don't want to, I don't want that to be my therapy session. You know, I want it to be, I want to, I want to be able to say when my dad dies, I want to be able to say, yo, we did that shit. I'm proud of us. And I'm, I'm at that place. You know, my, if my dad dropped dead tomorrow, I would be distraught, but it wouldn't be because of all the bad things that happened. It would really be because damn, I really wanted more time. Do you have any, do you have any, um, Parts of your dad in you that oh, you despise absolutely. in him? <laughs> um, you know, not despise. Or I, yeah, yeah, that might not be the best word. But there, I, I'm definitely my father's child, and I point that out to him. Like when I first moved out, he was like, "You're selfish. I can't believe that you're gonna move out on this family." I was like, "Look, you moved out. You 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 came to this country on your own with a dream and like a little bit of change in your pocket. Like I'm your daughter. Why would that not be?" Um, and he recently, after a really good friend of mine, a sister friend died suddenly, and I, and I had to, like, and I chose to step in and, like, help handle the situation, he was very distraught because it was in the middle of COVID when COVID was first started, like, second year of COVID and in New York, and he was just like, I don't know why you have to go up there. I was like, Dad, if I died, you would want my body back. I was like, you know who I am. Don't tell me that. I know you're upset, but just, I'm going. And he called me and he left me this really sweet message. He's like, I'm not going to say that you're a prophet, but Allah is proud of you. I was like, thanks, Dad. Um, you, he's, he's had to figure it out, you know? He's had to work through. And whatever his journey is, I'm not sure. Like, he'll say things like, well, I don't know how you came to be this way. He's like, I'm just so proud of you. He's like, I see how you how you move, and I don't, I don't, I don't know where it comes from. I'm like, Dad, I'm part of, like, you're part of me, like, this is a reflection of you. My father was an airline mechanic, yo, and the running joke was in our family that I believed, because I have a huge imagination, that he was secretly a secret agent. Because <laughs> he was he never smelled like oil, fingernails never looked like he worked, he never looked like he worked with his hands. Mm. He would go out, we would fly for free, so I knew he was associated with them somehow, but I was like, is this a cover? I was like, I remember, I was like, Dad, you can tell us. He was like, what are you talking about? I think I was 16. I was like, you're a secret agent, aren't you? Like, you don't really work at the airport. Like, where do you really go when you leave here at night to go wherever? He was like, what are you talking about? I was like, you, you, he would be cologned down, fresh, to go put on, a, you know, to go work on the airplanes. And I'd be like, it's 11 o'clock at night. Why are you so fresh? And so he's always been... He's always had a side of him that's a lot of fun, and I definitely get that from him. He's also very adventurous, or he used to be. Um, and he said recently, like a couple years ago, he's like, I know ever since I became Muslim, I'm not as fun. I was like, Dad, you were so much fun. Like, so my, he didn't, he grew into? He grew into Islam. Okay. So our family's always been Muslim, but he wasn't, my dad was a rude boy. He used to run, like, like he, my father was a, he was run, he was a roughneck, running the streets kind of mm. dude. Um, but very smart. And when he got to this country, very blessed. Like, when I tell you that I feel like my father was dusted with some gold to kind of carry him through, who he is, who he, who, the life he's been able to create for himself, considering where, what his beginnings were, it's, it's, it just feels divine. And I've said that to him. I was like, you don't think, you know, it's like you, you got the furthest in terms of your family. Some people stop at London, they never leave Nigeria. You came to America. Like, that's a big deal. And you got here when nobody was giving out visas. They used to give out visas for, like, um, 30 days, 90 days. He got one for six months. To this day, he doesn't know how he got it. He just, it was stamped. Mm. He comes. When his papers run out, he was supposed to, he was like, you know, he said he used to work in these, he would have multiple jobs, and he would carry all the money on him. He would tape it to himself. 
because he knew at some point he was going to get picked up and they were going to send him back home because his papers had run out. And he used to work on U Street when it used to be like all warehouses and like junk. Wow. Car- yeah. So How long ago was that? It was like he came in the late 60s. Okay. So late 60s, early 70s, U Street was where a lot of people did auto mechanic body work. Hmm. And he ended up, he hustled his way into uh, this, this Jewish guy owned a shop. He hustled his way in. He was like, yo, I can do that kind of work. Because he was trying to move from being a taxi driver and a dishwasher. And, you know, the skills he had in Nigeria, he brought them with him. And they were like, all right, cool, let's try you out. And he ended up having a really good relationship with the dude. And the dude, and he said to the dude, like, hey, I want you to know, if you don't see me, it's because I got picked up. Hmm. My papers aren't good. He was like, oh, okay. He said, dude went made a call. Go to Baltimore on this date. Take your paperwork with you. He's like, just go. Don't worry about it. Went to Baltimore, and they processed him. Gave him a green card. And this was before you were born. Before I was born. So there has always been a sense of, like, blessing, I think, Mm -hmm. with my dad. And that sense of adventure and... That just like, yo, I'm going to have multiple things going on. Like, that's all my dad. Like, I'm like, dad, what are you talking about? So what is your, if you're not a practicing Muslim, do you have a specific spiritual belief system? I do. It's not, it's a mixture of a lot of things. I don't think that, um, I just don't think as human civilization, human civilization has, last, has existed for so, for thousands and thousands of years. Everyone talks to God in their own way. Um, I I am very much tied to my ancestors. I okay. definitely think that the way that I have been able to process the world has been because there's a certain amount of protection that they give me. And for me, knowing that, and I believe in guides, and I believe that we're all part of a larger source, and we all return to that, regardless of your religious perspective. Um, these systems, to me, are dangerous. Religious systems are dangerous because it gives too much power to to people and doesn't let people think for themselves. I mean, even when people do think for themselves, some of the material that they're using, I think is a little flawed. Mm. And so I am, you know, animal totems and, you know, I burn copal and I have altars all through my house. And sometimes I talk to the river, like I'm just kind of this thing that like I, to me, God is everywhere. So you used, I heard a term Remember where from one of the things I was listening and what you just said is that what personal intuitive work is? Yeah, I mean essentially it's you. It's you understanding that the divine. If you if you are if if God made everything, then you are of the divine. We're all of the divine, which is why religious systems that don't acknowledge the female face of God, I don't. I find I don't trust it. You can't just wipe out you know, half of the population. That doesn't make sense to me. Um, So that personal intuition is really about understanding where in your body your God source sort of lives. So mine lives in my gut. And there are different ways to access that, whether it's through meditation or whether it's through certain, you know, rituals that you do in terms of, you know, food, you know, smoke, whatever. Um, But yeah, the intuition, the idea of the intuition is that it's there. It's, It's always been there. How do you nurture that? How do you, yeah, how do you, how do you nurture it in yourself? I nurture it by visiting my altar. I nurture it by, um, when thing, I nurture it in, in the way that I sort of operate. So it's, I don't get as upset as I used to about certain things. Like disappointment is a little harder for me to access um, because I do believe that those things that compel me to st- like if I'm moving and someone's like stop and I stop there's a reason for that you know if I am supposed to be somewhere and all of a sudden the car doesn't work or there's all this traffic I'm like whatever's stalling me is for a reason um if I apply for something and I don't get it you know I think to myself that's that's probably for a reason and not that whole sort of oh everything happens for a reason but really understanding that for my system I do believe that my sister, my mom, my ancestors, like all the way back, walk with me. Like I have been in situations that probably weren't the safest and have felt really protected or have, 
you know, I call it, you know, the dodging of the bullets, as it were, things mm -hmm. that I really thought I wanted, and then somebody else gets it, and then I find out, like, oh, it's a complete shit show over there. You're so, you don't, you didn't want this. So it shows up in all those ways, but the nurturing really is every day, like, sitting and listening. You know, I, I have these conversations, you know, while I'm getting ready. I think about, you know, what I want my day to look like. I, you know, trust that as I'm moving through the world, because I have acknowledged my people and I, and I rely on them that they, that they have my back. And that feels like sometimes it's not, it's not prayer in the true sense of like what people are used to where you sit, but sometimes like some of my most divine moments are just sitting on my porch watching the birds, you know? So... I want to thank you. You're absolutely welcome. For you don't even know what yet. Can well, we, listen, Jesus. Uh, listen, man. No, no, no. I want to thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm listening. I'm gonna ask you a question that I know you know the answer to, but I'm gonna ask you anyway. Okay. What does baby boy, mm -hmm. Mo Better Blue, mm -hmm. Amistad, Black Panther? Do the right thing. Have in common. Oh gosh, baby boy. Black Panther, I'm a star. Do the right thing. Mo Better Blues. They're different directors. I mean, they're all black, black centered things. Um, men that don't listen at some point get Jesus. it right. I'm just, listen, um, you asked me. Really? Very strong, very um, compelling female characters. Uh, I don't know. Well, you, what is the answer? Ruth Carter. Oh, that's right. Malcolm X could be added to that list. She could. Yep. She's amazing. Your podcast put me on a trajectory. Really? of learning about her. She's amazing. And I was moved. Oh, wow. Did you watch the episode? Yes. Wasn't it powerful? It was powerful. Oh, gosh. I got so much out of it. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to talk to you about that. Thank you for listening, first of all. I appreciate that. You're welcome. In that doc, in that um, art abstract thing, I can't remember what it's called. Ruth Ab Carter, yeah. abstract of design. Or yeah. Like that. Mm -hmm. So Ruth Carter is the costume designer mm -hmm. for Black Panther. She won the Oscar for yep. it for people who, and she had spent all of this time in the bamboo shoot phase. The bamboo shoot phase. It was a little bit longer than five years. <laughs> 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 but five hey, years is yeah. It's no. a it, that's yeah. going to be relative, depending on the individual. Yes, talk, absolutely. But Wait, explain the bamboo shoot phase because so, people might not know what that's about. Bamboo is a very resilient, I guess, um, thing to grow, mm -hmm. and. One of the reasons why I guess it's so dominant is because most of its time is spent growing underground and developing all of these complex systems, mm -hmm. growing into things and roots and doing mm -hmm. all of that. So by the time it actually comes up, it's very well planted mm -hmm. in the environment that it's in. So it's virtually impossible to get it out based right. on the network gets created underneath. Did I do a good job? You did a great job. Okay. And the piece, the piece that, and this is important because to the untrained eye, it looks like what happens? Nothing. And then all of a sudden, it just, it just yeah, shoots it up. It just shoots up, yeah. yeah. And so Ruth Carter, and you were talking, you had a podcast where you talked about Ruth Carter and how you feel you might be in the bamboo shoot because you were going Paolo Coella. Yeah, Paolo, Paolo, Paolo Coelho is the author. He's the author yep. for a book. And I know I'm all over the place. The Forgive book me is in Aleph. Aleph. Yep. Ruth Carter is the costume designer who did Black Panther, where she finally got her quote-unquote 
flowers, her mm -hmm. notoriety, where the bamboo just shoots straight up. Shoots straight up. But she has spent all of this time doing work for films. Mm -hmm. When's the last time you heard of, when's the last time somebody went and actually looked for the goddamn costume director, sure. right? Just isn't something people do. Right. And she recognized that, I'm sure, but she did Amistad, she did More Better Blues, mm -hmm. she did Malcolm X, she said she did Do the Right Thing. Mm -hmm. um, she did School Days. School Days, yep. Baby Boy. Mm -hmm. She did all of these, all of these movies. And then one day she just pops up through Black Panther, and everybody's talking about how great she is, acknowledging But wait a minute. You remember the piece that I thought was most fascinating? She did all that work, and when Black Panther called, she almost didn't do it because she almost was scared. She was scared. She was too scared to do it. She thought she wasn't going to be able to do it. Because of how she, the research and stuff that she did in the past, and mm -hmm. because this was like a future new and it place. Was a brand, it was like a place that didn't exist, and so before she had tied herself to history, and it was easy to kind of research, but... This was like creating everything from scratch. I related what she does to what you do in a way. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to me. Because of how she creates and how it's this thing that, I don't know, complements or you know, enhances the story mm -hmm. in some in some way. You you're doing a very different thing, but I I feel like it's on the back end. So to the Ruth to Ruth Carter, in the segment, she made it. She said a, she made a statement, and I got to look it up real quick. I love it. That's such a great that's such a great episode. She said, I needed to look like what I'm feeling in my soul. There were two things she said in that joint that stood out to me more than anything. I love it. I need this shit to look like what I'm feeling in my soul. Right. I'll know it when I see it, mm -hmm. but I can't describe it. Yep. And I'm in pursuit of that. Mm hmm is that how you? <laughs> yeah, all day, every day. Like that's, and you know, I I so appreciate this moment because like what you just said is almost like you were speaking life into me, like in this moment, because um, when I was asked to direct an opera, there were two, two responses. One was like, what? Why? And that was maybe one or two people. And everybody else was like, oh, that makes sense. Mm. And trying to adapt a story for a black lead from an opera that was based on a white woman who was Swiss required that I had to readapt the story for this particular use. And there were all of these they weren't barriers to me, but it was a very clear translation issue because I know what I want. I know how to articulate it, but I don't speak theater. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't speak lighting cues. I don't speak um, stage cues. I just know what I want. And so, yeah, that's kind of everything that I've ever done. The true sense of me being satisfied with it is if I could actually achieve that. That's a hard thing to explain to people when they don't see things in that way. Oh, it's very difficult. People think you're being difficult. People think you're being flaky. People might think that, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, they can be dismissive, but, you know, okay, I'm here for a reason. You're being paid to do a job. Figure it out. Did perspective change for you in terms of how you created when you were doing the um, the play? The opera? Yeah, the opera. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, so the opera itself is based on a woman that existed, I want to say in the 1800s. She was Swiss. She leaves Switzerland, dressed as a man, goes to Algeria, finds a Sufi order, becomes Muslim, and then falls in love with an Algerian soldier. 
she's very critical of the French government at the time and the way that it's treating Algeria. So the, the Europeans aren't sure, like, whose side are you on? At some point, they send an assassin to kill her. They fail at that attempt. She is estranged from her husband throughout their marriage. You know, she's got this, her own sense of, of how she wants to see the world, and she's reckless in a lot of ways. But there's a sense of her that's just not, she's, she's restless at the same time. Um, when she finally gets back with her husband, she decides, let's go live in the desert. Mm. The desert, there's peace there. We can, be, we can be away from all of this nonsense. And at the same time, it feels like her life is short-lived and that death has just been on the back of her neck this entire time. So when this flash, they called it a flash flood, but you know the desert has a lot of weird, natural sort of storms that happen. Instead of running for cover, she stood in place and faced it and dies. And her journals are the way that they are able to craft her story together. So when this opera was done, it was done with this woman's story completely in mind. And so when they decided to produce it with a black lead, I was like, well, we, I'm not interested in sending a black woman to Algeria. And I'm also not interested in like chocolate Barbie doll dipping her in this story. Like it needs to make sense for her. So I said it in the 1940s. Mm. Um, because I wanted to showcase sort of black wealth and trauma. So she leaves the South that she's from as a result of, you know, white massacre coming in and like destroying the town and killing people. She goes to Detroit and she discovers the Nation of Islam. And that is how that's her conversion a, happens. That's a bit okay. Detroit. Detroit. Because Detroit, Mosque Number 1 was founded in 1940 in, in Detroit, uh, Nation of Islam. Um, and I also love Malcolm X's autobiography and the way he talks about the nation and what the nation does for him. Like, there's a lot of issues, yes, with the nation, but when you think about what the Nation of Islam gave black Americans at that time an alternative way to not only access God, but access their, their humanity, mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, that's what I want for her. Okay. Um, and then, you know, she, in my version, she falls in love with a, an, a fruit of Islam soldier. It's forbidden she leaves and she goes west. So she ends up in the Bay Area, dies in the desert that way. Um, being able to articulate, like draw down that story, because I remember pacing in my living room studio, trying to figure out how we're gonna tell this story, how we're gonna make it authentic for a black woman. And that, that sense of I'll know it when I, when I, when I can see it was, was kind of there. And also just wanting to expand the spiritual consciousness of what blackness can look like and the way that she moves was important to me. So she carries her Bible and she has to take her father's coat. She takes her mother's hat. She takes her brother's shirt because they're all dead and she has to carry these things with her. So she becomes this moving altar as we go through the story. Um, mm, I like the way that sounds. The perspective of what I'm trying to create is requires everyone tapping into my language. And so that's where there were disconnects. It was because people were having a hard time. When it worked, it was freaking fantastic. So there are moments in the production that I'm that just take my breath away. Like the day of the production, it was on a Saturday, May 21st, I woke up and um, I had to come in two weeks ahead. So I'm there rehearsing. I'm having to learn how to read a score because there's no script in opera. There's the oh, libretto. Wow. There's the composition. So there's the music, there's the words, and you have to look at the score to see how the words are sung. And I don't, I'm not a music reader, so I'm learning how to say, this is what I need you to step down. This is the emotion that I need at this part. So I'm, all of the things, like I thought of, you know, the Ruth Carter piece was so powerful because I don't operate in opera, but as a cultural architect, if that's the medium, then that's what I'm gonna do. And so there, was these, there were these moments where I was like, yo, it didn't occur to me that I was out of my depth. It didn't occur to me that what I was doing was particularly big. I was just, I had a job to do. I had a story that I had to get out and I was just gonna do it. So Saturday I wake up and I am so emotional. I can't stop crying. Like the whole, the whole idea of what has been created is just, it is just like, it's like all kind of coming down on me. My dad couldn't come because he did, something happened with his dental work so he had to stay. And so he's like, yeah, I can't come, but I'm wishing you well. We've been checking in on me. And then one of my really good friends, she was able to make it. So that kind of grounded me in it. But man, let me tell you something. When you're creating these things, 
that seemingly fall out of the sky and you actually get to see it. There are moments where I step outside of myself was like, yo, you did that? And I'm like, yo, I guess I did. And there's, there's this interesting sort of self-talk that you're doing because it's like, yo, this is really kind of dope. I get to do this. This is not the life that I, that I planned or that I even th thought was possible, especially because I'm not, I don't have that, I'm like, I'm not solidly in that background. Yeah. The fact that someone was like, I, you're a visionary and I think you could do this. You know, that's where that tribe, that advisory committee, it comes in handy, you know? It really does because it, sometimes people can see you further along than you can see yourself. So when I think about Ruth Carter talking about that moment where she's thinking about saying no and that the fact that she wakes up and she just trusts that if Ryan Coogler yeah. thinks that she can do it, that should be enough. That's, that's what nurturing that intuitiveness looks like. Because sometimes what's blocking your intuitiveness is the conditioning of pride, the conditioning of, oh, you're not good enough, and so you can't feel it. So having that person outside of you to be able to say, no, you can't do this, that, that makes the journey, you know, it makes the leaping a lot easier. What you are saying sounds so beautiful. <laughs> it, I'm not even... I love it. It's a... There are various forms of creating, mm -hmm. and sometimes we've got like these narrow, I believe, concepts of of creating. Absolutely. And even just what of what art is, mm -hmm. and watching her segment, I have a very intimate relationship relationship with the process of doing this, mm -hmm. even though it doesn't necessarily always end up being what I want it to be, there's a process that I have where I can look at things and see things and make connections to things in ways that like a, a person on the outside in may not understand. Right. But because I have this specific relationship to it, it's a form of art in a yeah, way for me. Absolutely. And I never, when you, for me, when you look at costumes and stuff and her relationship to that task is something that you would never think a human would devote their life to. And it was a beautiful relationship. Yeah. Her depth of knowledge and just how she saw things and the connections that she would make. And she said something that where it was, she said, she said, uh, She wants the colors to support the words, the mm -hmm. dirt, and the sea. And I was like, how could you look at clothes and even think that? Yeah. But if you look at some shit long enough or you, you have a strong enough relationship to it, 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 it becomes art. And when you, and the thing about Ruth Carter is that when you look at anything that she touches, the fact that you don't notice the clothes means that she's done exactly what she's supposed to do. Yeah. Like you don't question anything. You just assume that in Amistad, this is the way people dressed. Yeah. Um, it's really, really powerful. That episode is to me one of the best in the series because it was fun to watch her be celebrated. Yeah. Peep game though. When I watched it, I had no idea that two months later, the woman who organized that retrospective it was the costume curator for this opera. So I got to meet Demetria Bocelli and I was just like, ma'am. So she was the one that organized the first stop in Pittsburgh. Where they, where they, um, where, where they filmed it. That filming where they, they that was Demet Demetria made that happen. Oh, wow. And I got to meet her. Um, and I was like, yeah, I know that that opera Doing that particular project is, I give it a year, I'll look back and be like, that was the moment. Mm. When all the networks had solidified and the bamboo shoot goes up. I like the statement that Oprah told her about art being prayer. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why I'm not a big Oprah fan. Maybe because I feel like, I don't know. I got a lot of reasons why. She operates like a white woman. I know why. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot. But that was, that was pretty, uh, 
That stood out to me for some reason. It's true. I mean, it's, um, I remember telling someone that what I do is like, it's mediumship. I don't always think it's me that's writing some of this or even when I do the podcast, um, you know, I don't, whenever I'm like, okay, it's time to do an episode. Um, I stopped trying to, I was trying to do it every week and it was just like, that's just not going to be your way. When you have something that you can articulate, that's when you'll do your thing. And so there's one that I haven't done yet that I was talking about, hanging out with these opera sisters. And um, the producer is a black woman. She's amazing. And she, I was telling, she was like, tell me about your podcast. And I was telling, I was like, yeah, there's one that I haven't figured out just how to tell it yet. But because, again, culture is my lens, I'm not always thinking in, just my timeline. I'm thinking in other timelines. Mm. Uh, and one of the, the, the second lead of the opera leaned back. She was like, Kat. I was like, what? She was like, that's an opera. I was like, what do you mean? She's like, that's an opera. You need to write it. And so the beauty of an Oprah saying that it's prayer or you being able to take a podcast and then go find that need, that seed that you need in what you're doing is that that's why we do it. That's the beauty of the, of, the, of the cultural lens for me is that because I deal in culture, I'm not limited to one scope. Yeah. Wherever you drop me, I'm going to find something that I can draw a thread to. And so. And that's is, a skill. It's a prayer. And it, a gift. Yeah, it is a gift. It's, it, it keeps me. Like I, I, <laughs> as much as I'm surrounded by people, my life, I have a lot. There's a lot of solitude in my life. There's a lot of isolation. So it it's it keeps me it keeps me hopeful, you know. Like Do you I, judge the solitude? No, it doesn't because I realize that I realize with the various timelines that I live that I probably, in a lot of ways, called it in. As much as I don't, as much as I would love to have like a partner and all of that, I do realize that there's a part of me that because of the amount, the sheer amount of taking care of I've had to do, there is a part of me that enjoys solitude, that kind of claims that for myself. And is this what you would call your spirit contract? Look at somebody who's been listening. I think it is part of my contract in terms of, um, I do think that part of my, so just to explain people who don't know what I'm talking about, I believe that we all come back with a contract, an agreement that we have with our source that says, this time around, these are the things that I'm supposed to do. We don't always meet those contractual obligations, and I do believe the contract can be amended. Okay. But I do believe that, to a certain extent, um, the way that I live is a reflection of me wanting to fulfill these many sort of lives that I've lived. Like There are times where I'm like, there's a lot happening right now. It all makes sense, but it feels like five different people. Um, and then there is... There are elements that I'm like, you know, this is cute, but I don't like having to do all this by myself. I want some sort of partnership, and I need you to make it chop, chop. And so I, I say all this to say that sometimes, you, you, you know, you have to go back and think about, well, maybe this wasn't the best contract. Maybe I need to kind of reshape this. And then sometimes it's like, all right, give me more. You know, I need, I need more of this and less of that. So this year I actually put together a vision board specifically to help with my contract to say, okay, these are the things that I really want to focus on. And the, it's been working. It's been fantastic. I heard a little bit of contradiction there, but I'm not going to challenge you. You should challenge me. I'm Go for it. No. Uh, Listen, give it to me. There are, two, there are two thoughts that are competing with one another. This is my life, yes. Okay. I'm, and I'm aware of that. Like, I know what I want. I know what I say, and I know how I, I, yeah, absolutely. What do you want? Depends on the day. Oh, shit. It's true. It depends on the day. There are days where I would love to, like, not be responsible for anything. I ain't got to make money. I ain't got to do nothing. But that's what you'll, what do you? What? That doesn't make sense. What do you mean it doesn't make sense? So, what do you want? Because mm -hmm. a relationship is not that. I know. So what do you want? I want 
the freedom to come and go as I please. If I'm honest, yeah. You have that now. Yeah, but, you know. So expand. Well, you're right. I do have that now. Um, it would be nice. So great example. It would be nice. It would have been nice. Um, love that my friend Maria Luz came up because it was really heartwarming. But it would have been nice to have a partner, you know, I don't know if that's a husband or a boyfriend or whatever you would call it, but a partner that in me doing this opera was kind of there to witness it. It would be nice to not have to be sort of fully responsible because like financially, I'm fully responsible for a lot of things. Like in Can terms I pause of- you for a second? What you gonna pause, what, what's up? I asked you what you want, you tell me what's nice. Oh, we. Oui. Are you coaching me right now? So what I wanted, I want. No, 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 no. No, 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 I, no, love no, no I love it. I love it. My coach says it's like mm, you didn't answer the question. I love it. No, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I it, it really does depend on the day. But that's not a relationship, Rissy Kai. Maybe you, not. Because it, it so uh, what I'm hearing you describe <laughs> is it, confusion and madness. No, no, no. Is <laughs> it's <is> like. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that. It's <laughs> it's um. When's the last time you've been in a relationship? It's been a while. Okay. It's. I mean, so to be fair, like all jokes aside, that is what I would. I would love to have the experience of being um, in sort of a committed, not sort of. I shouldn't say sort of, in a committed relationship. Okay. Where we have expectations and we have each other's back and their support, and that sort of there's an understanding that we're going to grow together. I would love to have that experience. Why do you think it was so hard for you to say that? Because it takes me a minute sometimes to process. Because that question of want, the conditioning of, of my conditioning, makes it very hard for me to get it that it takes a while. Because it's not something that I get asked a lot. So oftentimes I'm operating from a space of, this is what I have, let's go. This is what you're dealing with. This is what you're dealing with. And so when someone says, what do you want? that becomes a harder question to answer. So usually I have to, so I appreciate you pushing me. So, and that might be why on your vision board, when you first started with the vision boards, like the dude came a little bit later. Oh, we, get out of my business, James. Yeah, can I be, to be fully transparent because I saw a Luna moth and that vulnerability is the thing. Um, when I was done and I went to look at it, I had completely left it off. I had to go back in and rearrange. I was like, oh shit, what is, like, I was actually quite shocked by that because I just assumed that it was in there somewhere and I had been really specific about my health, about travel, about, you know, some of the projects that I'm working on, about, you know, the, the house that, you know, the type of house that I'd like to have and all these other things, but that wasn't there. And I've been struggling most of, for better part of, the, of a decade, trying to understand what the push and pull is with that, because it is is an issue. Like I can't, I can't even, I can't even like people are like, "Why are you single?" <laughs> I'm like, "It's me. It's got to be me." Because I don't, you know, it's. I think there's for me there's a. Um, I need to see it before I can believe it's. You know, it's. You need to see what. I need to see the the action, or I need to see the interest, or I need to see like the intention. So, and it's and it shouldn't ideally. If it's something that I want, it shouldn't depend on that. But I think that is that is that is part of the the hangup. And I'm not necessarily I can't call it in terms of where it comes from. I mean, I know what it's like to be in a situation where we're both there and we're building. Um, but I've like, it's been really short. Like I haven't had like, I've never actually been with somebody for more than six months. Your whole life? My whole life. It's like, I was thinking about it because there's an article that came out in the New Yorker, I think, where a woman talks about, she's in her thirties being like, she's, she's been perpetually single for her whole life. Um, while she's had like dates here and there, like it's really been just like her. I was like, oh, I was reading it and I was like, yeah, that's, I can relate to that. So. I was talking to a friend the other day who makes music. 
And I told him that his most beautiful song is going to be the one that he makes with his woman. No. Oh. And that's going to be, out of all the songs he's ever right. made, the one that he makes with her, mm -hmm. meaning their life. Yep. And, and he and I talk a lot about uh, our ability to create in these spaces mm -hmm. that we can actually, that we should, we can, take that same ability and manifest it in these other areas. Right. It's going to be a little bit more work. Right. Because, like, like you're using sounds you ain't never used before mm -hmm. and, you know, shit like that. But I think to your point, the fact that the, the dude wasn't even on there. Child, it was a mess. <laughs> I was so distraught. I was like, yo, what is wrong with you? Um... It was really, dis I was disturbed for a while. I was like, okay, well, let's rearrange things. I put it in a place that was prominent. And I have it set up so I see it every day at my desk. But I I was, <laughs> I, I was like, well, you know, it's, it's okay if that's, if that's, it's okay either way. But I do want to understand, like I have been, because my, my, I have a coach and she's been like, what's going on in that department? And she's pushing me to really think about that. And the thing is, it's not like I haven't tried. I've tried the apps. And I actually paid to get, um, I paid a matchmaker for a while to try that. So I actually have like tried and it just, whew. I think the, it's so crazy. I think once you choose it, you'll get it. I think so too. Cause I don't, cause there's nothing. There's nothing you it's can't weird. do. It's weird, There's right? There's nothing you can't. Like I directed a fucking opera. I yeah, like, like, dude, like, I've, what's I've the got a, I'm sitting across from an opera director. Like, what is the problem? I don't even know what that really means, but I know <laughs> I know it's a oh big my deal. God. It, apparently, um, yeah, I don't, it's, I, you know, I remember at some point being very honest about, like, when I had to make peace with my father, I know that the way he showed up definitely affected how I was relating to men. And I remember there was one person that I dated that I absolutely thought I was going to marry. It did not happen. But I remember when I realized that because my dad really just was not, like when my mom died, he was there, but he wasn't there, mm. that I was like, oh, shit, I have abandonment issues. And so I remember at the time I was dating this guy, and Sophie was in and out of the hospital, so he was actually seeing some of this part of my life. And... We were not, at some point, we, weren't just, we just weren't communicating. Like, all of a sudden, it felt like a switch had flipped. And like, it just was, and I didn't understand, like, why it was falling apart. And I remember looking at him and saying, you know, I used to be a, because he was, like, the first person I ever dated that when I say showed up, like, showed up. I think I've told you, like, bought groceries, was, like, really, he was really observant about what my needs were. So mm -hmm. that I, things that I didn't even know that I was doing, he was paying attention to. So that was really, I'd never actually had someone actually think about my needs as part of this life. So it was, it was really nice and comforting. And I remember thinking, you're afraid to, to go back to the way your life was because then you have to, you know, it, someone actually caring about your well-being um, in that way, who's not a parent, who's not a friend, it's, it's something different. You're not used to it. Mm. But I remember thinking that I don't want to be in a situation where I'm afraid to lose you, so I put up with your bullshit. So... I basically looked at him and I was like, I'm not afraid to lose you. I was like, I was. But now that I understand what's pulling at me, if you got to go, then you got to go. But I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to try, but I'm not going to pen myself into a pretzel because that's just, that's not fair to me. And that's just, that's stupid. Um, at least for me, it's just not a good look. Like, I'm not going to, I'm dope. Like, if that's not enough, then, then it's not enough. I, and whatever's going on has got nothing to do with me. Like, whatever the issue was, I realized, you know, after I took some time away, I was like, oh, it's got nothing to do with me. It's it's whatever was going on with him. But, yeah, I mean, it, I know what it feels like to be in a situation where everybody's on the same page and we're sort of building together. Um, do you believe in in love? Absolutely. You do? Mm -hmm. Have you ever been in that? Yeah. Yeah, I've experienced that. Exper Within six months, though. Yeah, because I don't think that I, this idea, I don't understand this idea that there's a time limit on 
love. Like, I just feel like that is a natural, energetic thing. It's not an excuse to do dumb shit, but I don't think that, I don't think it's hard to believe that you can be in love with someone in a short period of time. Do you feel it immediately? No. No. I think it was something that was unexpected. Um... And this wasn't the dude who was buying groceries, though. This was the dude who was buying groceries. Oh, it was? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, how do I say this? I'm sorry, brother, by the way. If you looking at this... He ain't looking at I'm this. I'm not trying to reduce you to... No, he ain't looking at this. ...to a grocery guy. No, I'm he sure, ain't looking at this. Uh, okay. But that was... I'm a practical... Well, hold on. Why? Don't do that. No, he's not. I don't he, think he... I, he might... He's not looking at this. I see what you're saying. It's been a long time. Okay. Um... The grocery thing was a big thing for me. Really? Yeah, it was a huge thing because as a caretaker person, you know, you're always thinking about all of these things. You learn very quickly how to minimize blowout, damage, whatever. Um, And so you're always thinking like two or three steps ahead. So if you see that milk is halfway, you might go do that. But I, one of the things that happens when you're a caretaker is you don't take care of yourself. So... While I could make sure my brothers ate and all this other stuff, or my sister was good with her meds, I wasn't doing a good job of taking care of myself. And I remember, I think he'd come to the house and he looked in the fridge and he was like, what's going on here? I was like, what? He was like, you don't have groceries. Like, what is happening? I was like, oh, I don't really think about it. I just pick stuff up when I, you know, when I need to. And um, one of the first times he like spent the weekend because we lived like while he was we both lived in Maryland, he was further away than I was from DC. Um, he came with groceries, and it was a really that was one of the first times I felt like somebody actually saw what my needs were, mm. um, in a way that I didn't have to ask. Because part of the you already know this part of the the not asking and you know it's, it's toxic trait for sure, is that you want people to, at least for me, let me speak for myself, you do, I don't like asking because I'm like, can't you see it? You should yeah. be able to figure it yeah. out. Like, and then why, you judge them for not I'm being like, able to see you, it. How come you can't through osmosis figure out what I need? Um, and, you know, so for whatever reason, asking feels like such, uh, like, you're, like something's wrong with you, like you're weak or something. It's just, it's not right. It's part of the conditioning. Um, so he did it without asking. And he took this... This, this initiative, and it just, he folded my clothes. I would wash his clothes at his house because I, I didn't have a washer and a dryer, and he would fold my clothes. And that's when I knew the shit was about to come to an end because he didn't fold my clothes at one time. I was like, ugh. This thing oh. like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, man. It's over because... Because <laughs> he stopped folding your clothes? Yeah, because I, it wasn't something that I ever asked him to do. I remember I washed, I went down to put things in the dryer, and I'm forgetful when it comes to this stuff. And so I went back down to, he had disappeared. I didn't know where he went. I went back down to go take everything out because I was like, don't forget, because you, you know, you can forget to go fold. And they were already folded. And I was like, what is this? He was like, I just folded them for you. And I was like, wow, this is what it feels like to be taken care of in this way. It was really sweet. So when he didn't do it that one time, I was like, oof, this is a sign. We in trouble. Vision boards are based on, how you, I've never done a vision board mm-hmm. before, so is there a sp- section on the vision board of things that are like big deal things, or like how, how, is, how are they set up? Like However you want. Where's the dude on your vision board? So, good question. So, you set the vision boards up however you want. Some people deal in quadrants. They might say homework, lo- you know, love life, you know, whatever. I do it because of the way I am. It's all like a mal- it's like a thing. So, one of the things I did for this one was the backdrop that everything was on was a first class cabin on an airplane because travel is a big thing for me. Okay. And I like to be comfortable. Um, and it's something that I, you know, have been sort of manifesting for the last couple of years, like, you know, first class, business class, whatever. Um, I also, to be fair, my brother works for Delta, so I am his companion. I get to fly. Lots of places Delta's at a discount. my favorite. Uh, yeah, it's pretty awesome. They're the best airline, by the way, I feel. Right now they are. And it ain't hard to be because the bar is low, but they are. And so having had those experiences, I'm like, you know, I want that to be how I travel. 
And I want people, when they want me to do projects, when they fly me out, that's kind of the energy that I want. So that being the background, I just started laying things on top of it, like bathrooms that I absolutely have a thing for bathrooms. So architecturally, there's a bathroom that I would love to have one day and put that there. And, you know, my health was, I was definitely pandemic brought some health issues. So was putting those things up there, you know, putting up um, quotes from people that, you know, about me that, you know, I would like to be said about me. So you just, however you want to do it. So when I forgot the guy, I was like, oh shit, I had to go back in. And what I did was I put um, that part right next to my health and wellness. So they're kind of like synonymous. Companionship equals health. Mm, they're not synonymous, but I think they're a part of that. In terms of, in terms of, in terms of what can be, they can be independent. Mm -hmm. But they're, I mean, they're connected, but they don't, I don't necessarily see them, they're complementary. Like the idea is that you, they harmonize. Okay. Because I do think that there is something to be said about, I've lived alone most of my life, right? And so th I think there is something to be said about someone who can see your changes. I can't always see when I'm off track or when I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing yeah. or because there's nobody but like, there's hey no babe. Re you, no reflection. There's no reflection. Like you used to drink your cucumber juice, why are you drinking your cucumber juice? And so, you know, oftentimes this is where my friends can be really helpful. Like, well, I thought you were doing this, what happened? But I, I've always in my head, and it's, I could be romanticizing the whole experience, but I do think one of the beauties of those kinds of um, intimate relationships is that there's someone there that can see. Witness. And witness your growth, yeah. your missteps, your whatever, um, to remind you sometimes, like, yo, you got this, or yo, you're better than this. Um, and that intimacy kind of helps make, helps make that feedback a little bit more empowering in some way, shape, or form. And, I'm, and I know that with every relationship, there's always ups and downs and whatever, but yeah. I've always imagined that I always, I've always felt like I would benefit, really, from having an intimate partner who kind of was sort of lockstep with me, like at least in the sense of, hey, we're both trying to do this and we want to do this together. I just, you know, I just always thought that that would be good for me. So when you said abandonment issues, is that something you still kind of? No. You're good with that? Yeah. Now? I mean, I, I spend a lot of time in self-reflection. I wanted, I did not think for a minute that, you know, my mom dying at 19 and my dad like being out here, leaving me to raise kids and stuff, wasn't gonna have an effect on me. But I remember I had this, like this crazy anxiety and fear once my fold, once my clothes were unfolded, um, once I realized that <laughs> something was happening with this relationship. Um, because when you're, when you're, when you get, when you experience for the first time, like someone who really cares about you outside of your, your natural network, it can be a bit addictive. You're like, oh, this is how I want to live. Like, this is the business right here. And yes, there are, you know, you have to work things out, but that, you don't want to let go of that. And I was feeling, I was, it, it, I felt like I was obsessing mm. over, to, I, I felt like I was obsessing way too much over this dude um, as I could see things sort of, sort of falling apart. And I just, uh, you know, I'd, I'd had the bad breakup, you know, the, the first love, you know, go left before and, that thing, it was stressful. I was like, I don't want to go through that again. So I need to understand what it is that I'm feeling. Because people are allowed to, like, not work out. Like, that's, yeah. you know, that's, that's fine. But what is it that I'm responding to? Um, especially for someone that I've only known for, like, six months. Well, I've known him for longer, but was dating. We only made it for six months dating. Like, why am I having this reaction? And so I had to sit through and kind of examine, you know, like, what, you know, what is it that I'm scared of? Like, is it... Being by myself, is it that, you know, if he leaves me, you know, no one's going to take care of me? Like, what exactly are all the things? And I really had to sit and think about, there are moments, you know, that you have. Like everyone has, when you think about the person that you're with or your person, there are moments that you have that solidify, yeah, this is my person. And I was thinking about those moments, and there were moments in there where he was at the hospital with me. Mm. Um, Sophie had had a major surgery and my dad showed up for all of like five minutes and um, 
but before that happened, I had I was sitting in the hospital waiting room, waiting. They were like, you can go home. You know, I was like, no, I'm going to stay here so I can be here when she comes out. I, I want to make sure she knows that I'm here. And so he left work, showed up unannounced, didn't tell me he was coming. And he's like, let's go. We're going to get some lunch. I already talked to the nurse. We got a couple more hours before she comes out. I'll sit with you until I have to go back to work. And he made me eat. And I'm, like I said, practical, those types of things, because of the way that I live, that, that stuff is meaningful. So, yeah, I mean, it was, um, I was like, I don't want that to go away. No. no. <laughs> I don't want that to go away. No. <laughs> what do I got to do? But then at the same time, like, he's allowed. Like, if he doesn't want to be with me, he doesn't want to be with me. So I don't want to, I wanted to understand it. What's next for you? I feel like you a good question. feel like you're on the cusp of some pretty I do. dope shit. Um, I think so this is the first this is the first time that I am going to be having a summer where I'm not teaching anything. So normally I'm a professor in addition to all these other stuff that I do. So normally I teach a summer class for five weeks or ten weeks or whatever. So I promised myself that I would well I got some really great advice, and I was like, okay. I promised myself and someone else. I was like, okay, I'm not going to work. I'm not going to teach. So this is my first summer where I'm not teaching. Um, I'm actually leaving for Amsterdam at the end of this month to go curate a dinner for um, – so Juneteenth is there's – a, there's, a June, there's a version of Juneteenth that exists in Suriname, which was enslaved by the Dutch. Did you do that last year? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, because so, I was – yeah. Okay. So they've asked me to come back, and this time we're doing a dinner. Um, it's going to be sort of a meeting of the minds of various culture creators from around the world who are going to come together. So I'm curating a dinner for that. So I'll be there. And when I get back, uh, I'm just going to write. And there's talk of taking the opera and possibly touring it. So we're going to see what, what kind of funding they can figure out and the other piece is figuring out if I can actually license my adaptation, if that's something that can be considered its own version, um, and if so, what that entails. And yeah, I'm just going to write and take dance classes, do more yoga. I'm just going to write now. It's really about me. And then, you know, as things, op you know, as, as opportunities present themselves, I'll be ready, but I got some things in the fire, so we'll see. I'm also doing some things with the Kennedy Center in the end of July. That joint you did last year with Zoe and, and uh, yeah, Tall Black Guy. That was so much fun. I, I, I was telling somebody the other day how dope it was that they had jump rope. Yeah. That was, an, that was a great... Double Dutch. Your mind and the way that that works, I was like, that, the line was long as yeah. shit. <laughs> To double dutch it was dudes in the double dutch line it was it was so much fun i'm that guy who double dutch with the girl i love it i was i wanted i'm gonna get me wrong i did all the other dude shit too but you don't need to clarify i wanted to go where the girls was at and uh i wasn't great at it but i definitely would get in there and fuck around because <laughs> why not that's where the girls was at right but um it was a great that joint felt good mm -hmm. Even with the rain yep. and um, Rome and Jamil was spinning. They, they both did that to both, right? Yep. At the end. Yep. And it was raining. And it, they remember the rain started right when it was almost over. It was perfect. And they kept, um, and I think he even played a song he with played rain. A Prince song. Yeah. yeah. It was fantastic. It was, it, was, it was a great, great event. It felt really good. Um, yeah, so please do that again. So well, this time, I really want to look at the diaspora. So I'm trying to figure out sort of a new world Africa approach so that it would be dance and, you know, movement. Like, there'll be some movement, there'll be performances, and they're definitely going to be the market again. Um, they're doing it a little differently this time, so it's not outdoors the way it was uh, okay. because the weather kept throwing everything off. So they're moving it inside. Um, so it's going to be a little weird. I'm only doing Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, but the cool thing is I get to show a movie so there'll be a big movie out in the big green area. So actually, I need to call the filmmaker today and beg him to let me show his film. But yeah, it's going to be... the. I, there hasn't been as much sort of diasporian, like, 
stuff from Haiti, stuff from the Caribbean. Like there hasn't been that much happening at the Kennedy Center. Mm. And so I'm always looking for ways to expand blackness whenever I am in the space. So okay. this one feels like it's going to be, you know, trying to find, I want to find like an Afrobeat artist, a Haitian artist to perform and some other folks. And somebody reached out to me and they're like, I do a mean reggae set with 45s. I was like, I don't mind that. Mm. So yeah, there may be some, some really cool DJ stuff happening as well. Um, not as the creative, not as Love it. the CEO, founder, president, mm -hmm. comptroller, <laughs> and not the con and office manager, office manager, <laughs> and maintenance man, maintenance, for, oh, for a little so so, right? But like, as the woman, as the woman, what do you need? I need my studio finished. If you know a good contractor, let me know. Okay. Um, started building a studio in my garage because I really wanted to expand the workspace. Um, and that's like an immediate need. Like I really, the house operates a certain way. And so like we talked about moving things around, I've been sort of stuck right now for the past year and a half, two years because that project started installed. So that's really, honestly, that is a priority. Okay. If I get that done, I can get a living room back and then I can start hosting my famous backyard parties, which is really a priority for me too. I heard it was all right. They was, they was fire. You didn't hear they was all right. I you heard they was, was fire. I mean, I, I mean, the couple of people I know who showed up said it was pretty mm -hmm. I'm sure. So I know somebody who, cause I had to get some work done. Mm -hmm here because it was a, a leak that came down through mm -hmm. i got the guy guy's name abraham oh nice and uh i know i was like every time i meet a dude named abraham i'll be like yeah it's a great name <laughs> it's a great name it's a solid name great name yeah I, de I definitely could use that help like okay getting the home front in order because when that's right it just helps me think better um what else do i need I need some potential candidates because now I'm on a mission to, to figure out this whole partner things, intimate partner thing. So, okay. you know, that. And then I really want like a really dope um, getaway. Like one of the things I, I love traveling with, I love traveling by myself, but I love traveling with friends. There's something really cool about, you know, people just being able to go somewhere together and have a really great experience. So. Would love to do that. If somebody could plan something, that would be great. Why well, I just have to show up and have my own room. I like that. Those are always fun. Usually if I, you know, I have to plan them, but I'd love to be in a situation where I just get invited. Somebody else has planned it all. And I have to kind of take that sort of weight off. Yeah, because that's a, you have to dispense a lot of intellectual and emotional calories to put all that kind of shit together. And you have to account for, everybody doesn't travel the same. Yeah. People change when they travel. Like I heard, I heard with women, that's a real thing. What do you mean? Women travel. I heard like there's a way in which women travel. Dudes, I heard it's just like you know. Yeah, because dudes are a lot more. At least in my experience, um, it's hard. Like I, because everyone's traveling style is different. Like I'm not a person who needs to go look at the tourist attraction. I'm actually the person that low key will probably sleep the first two days. And yeah, I paid however much for this hotel room, but I'm gonna sleep. Yeah. I'm gonna watch some TV, I'm gonna relax. I don't necessarily need to get out in the streets. And I'm also, you know, traveling has, social media has, in my opinion, really damaged the way traveling is done. Everyone's doing, not everyone, a lot of people are doing things so they can say, look what I'm doing. Um, so even when you travel, it's like, you're running into people's TikToks and those other shit and it's like, yeah. yo, can't you just, like, this is an amazing view. Can you just enjoy it? Relax. And relax. So, and also, you know, I like traveling. I like to be comfortable. I like the luxness of, of, of a good travel situation. And I like to be pampered and, you know, I like rooms with butlers and, like, great sheets and stuff like that. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to keep that in mind. Thank you. Especially that contractor. If you can find me somebody. I got a couple of candidates, but they want a lot of money. 
Yeah, this dude was pretty reasonable. Okay. So, how do you feel? I am so glad I did this. Really? Yeah. Why? 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 Because this is definitely the most varied conversation I've had with someone. <laughs> okay. Which I appreciate. No, no, I do appreciate it. Um, I also, you're good. You're a really good interviewer. Like you think? You, I think so. You asked really good questions. Like, I've watched, you know, some of your stuff, and I, I think that you have something really special with the way that you're doing things. Um, yeah, this feels like I felt, like, comfortable and safe, and, you know, that, that felt good. And then told you I'm a business, so Lord knows what you're going to keep. Well, all I got was from somewhere else, and then I just spit it back out at you. Yeah, but it, it's, it doesn't work if we're not in sync in some way, shape, or yeah, form. So, that's true. Yeah, so, you know, you're going to take this accolade. Cause, I'll take it. Yeah, because okay. I, was, I, was I was trying to throw it back. Don't throw it back. Nope. nope. Yeah, you said it about yourself. I'm yeah, dope. Nope. Mm-hmm. I'm dope. No, nope. you're dope. I'll take that. Own it. Thank you. you. Own it. So, yeah, I'm glad that I did this. This was... I knew it was going to be good because I've seen how you, like, I really loved your, the one that you did with Ashe. Like, that one, I remember, because I think that was the first one. Was that the first one? Well, that's the first one I saw. That was the first woman. First woman. And I thought. She had to be the first one. I I wasn't going to be able to. The way you handled, like, that, the content, because she and I had talked about, um, her diagnosis a while back, and I was so proud of her for sharing it because it is something that a lot of black people don't know about, and I was like, I'm sure there are black kids dealing with this. It would be good for them to know that this exists and that they're not alone, but I just think the way that I just loved watching that that swirl, it was really really dope. Thank you for that. She's, I mean, you know, she's she's amazing. She's one of them people who, you're a beautiful person. Yeah. And a lot of, I mean, you know. She's, she's, oh, God bless her, Shay. So, thank you so much. Absolutely welcome. For the time. I'm glad I got to, you said something in one of the things. I learned so much about myself through the process of learning about other, and help, helping, helping and learning about other people. Yeah. It always just seems to turn back. Mm -hmm. And so, through the process of preparing for this and getting to know you a little bit more, I was like, I feel so full. Oh, I love it. And that was a great, it's a great feeling. And, and, and I, I hope I could have, hope I could share that with you. Listen, in some way. on the inside, you know, <laughs> trying not to be like, I, I'm feeling emotional in a good way. Like you're giving me a lot to think about. Um, I love that. It's like I love the challenge. Good, because you know we the same. Anyway, um, wait, wait, what was that? No, it's just <laughs> I, I. You're a great person. Thank you. I appreciate that. So you're pretty dope yourself. Thank you. Jack of all trades.